Many of us may have a mental image of pirates of long ago. Perhaps they may be like the fictional Long John Silver and Captain Jack Sparrow, or the very real and terrifying Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard. Real-life Welsh pirates include Henry Morgan of Llanrumney, Howell Davis of Milford Haven, and Bartholomew Roberts of Casnewydd Bach near Fishguard, better known as Black Barty or Barty V. They flourished briefly in what has been called the Golden Age of Piracy in the late 1600s and early 1700s. But more than a century earlier, there was a Welsh pirate who was as infamous in his own time as any of those just mentioned. He was John Callis, a man much feared in the 1500s. Details of his life are sketchy, and in some places they are contradictory, probably having been embellished over the centuries. But we know for sure that he existed and that he had carved out a lucrative life of crime. Most pirates' careers were cut short by being killed in action or captured and hanged. But Callis was different. He was, apparently, a pirate with a long career. Decades, according to some accounts. How did he do it? Well, he found a great way to make his career sustainable. He made himself useful to a lot of people and apparently also gained some powerful friends. It's probably worth making clear that this is not the tale of a lovable rogue. From all the accounts that uh, survive, it appears that John Callis was a cruel and ruthless man given to tormenting and torturing his victims. Most accounts state that he was born in Monmouthshire, although a claim is made for Pembrokeshire, probably in the first half of the 1500s, but we have no date. As a young man, he went to London and became a retailer, selling what we don't know. Later, he joined the Royal Navy, and it seems that he eventually commanded his own vessel. It's claimed that his life of piracy began when he seized an Italian ship and sold her cargo in Cardiff. Soon he was on his very own pirate vessel. How did he acquire one? We don't know, but perhaps a clue is in the name of one of his ships. It was cheekily called Cost Me Naught. But not for him, the blue waters of the Caribbean. He stayed closer to home, mainly sailing the Bristol Channel and around the British Isles. Callis robbed ships of many nations, not just those of the great rivals of the day, France and Spain, but those of the Dutch, the Danes, the Scots. It looks like he would take just about any ship he could get his hands on. He seems to have been indiscriminate. Here are some of the things he was said to have seized. And as for his character, one account stated that Callis threatened to torture a severely injured Danish captain unless he revealed where valuables were hidden on his vessel. And what did he do with the stolen goods? Well, of course he sold it all. He fenced it, mainly here in South Wales, it seems. He was a regular in Penarth and Cardiff and sold his goods along the coastline as far as Haverford West. It seems that he was not discreet. People knew of his haunts, they knew he was selling stolen goods. So an obvious question is, why wasn't he arrested, tried and hanged, as would have been normal practice back then? The answer, in a word, is corruption. Callis must have had a network of associates, people who were in cahoots with him. They probably enjoyed the exotic goods that he sold them. A Cardiff magistrate named Thomas Lewis, for instance, had arrested pirates brought before him and he just released them on bail, which would have been very unusual. He must have had a good reason for doing so. Even Sir John Perrott, Vice Admiral for South Wales and therefore a significant government figure, 
was accused of complicity with Callis. But complaints were pouring in from ambassadors of those countries whose ships Callis was preying upon. The government in London, although usually ambivalent about piracy against its rivals, was getting fed up and losing patience with a man the Privy Council called a notorious malefactor. They complained that his actions were a diplomatic embarrassment to Queen Elizabeth I. The Spanish ambassador said he had complained for four years about pirates, including Callis, but that nothing was done. The pirates carried on and no compensation was paid. The French ambassador complained that Callis had tortured the men and mariners with extraordinary cruelties. The Privy Council wrote to Sir John Parrott, noting that Callis had been arrested, but had somehow managed to escape. They stated, Their lordships do not a little marvel at the negligence of such as are justices in those parts, that, knowing the said Callis to be so notable an offender, and spoiler of such Her Majesty's neighbours as are in good league and amity with her. They added that the Welsh justices have apprehended some of the poorest and permitted the chiefest pirates to escape. Things were finally getting hot for Callis. He was a wanted man and needed to lay low. It is known that he spent some time at this West Wales pub, the Point House on the Angle Peninsula. It thrives all these centuries later. Finally, Callis was arrested and taken to the Marshalsea Prison in London. The game was up. He was facing the hangman's rope. But he had a card to play, information. He was said to have tried to cut a deal with the authorities, telling them of his haunts and the names of people who had been in league with him. As modern criminals might say, he turned rat. And at this point, the story of John Callis diverges sharply. One report has it that he was, despite his best efforts to cooperate, hanged at Newport in 1576. Another is more colourful. It has it that in July 1578 he was released. There was even talk of a pardon from the Queen herself, unlikely though that seems. He allegedly joined an expedition by Sir Humphrey Gilbert to raid the Spanish settlements in the Caribbean. This version of the story has it that he returned, was imprisoned in Ireland and escaped. Then he spent the rest of his days as a pirate on North Africa's Barbary coast, being killed in action in the mid-1580s. If this second version is true, and his career had been long, then he would likely have been getting on a bit, middle-aged or more, at the time of Sir Humphrey's expedition. We'll probably never know for sure how the Welsh pirate John Callis met his end, but we do know that during his lifetime he was much feared by seamen. Perhaps also he was revered by those people who benefited from his life of crime.